Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Talented Learning Executive Briefing Series. I'm John Lay, the CEO and lead analyst at Talented Learning, and this is my favorite series of content because we get to travel the world virtually and meet with the world's best learning system providers, and we learn about what they do, how they do it special, and even hear about and see some examples. And today's no different. We have one of my favorite high-end organizations in the world, uh, Extension Engine, that just provides learning experiences and custom solutions to some of the world's uh, most premier brands. And we're going to learn all about it today and all about the Extension Engine solution. And I'm going to turn it over to the founder or the, the partner, rather, Furkan uh, Naziri, and we'll let him and his team take it away. Furkan, all yours. Thanks, John. Excited to be here. This is a wonderful opportunity. I've uh, been a longtime fan, excited to uh, share a bit about us. Um, I'm Furkan Naziri. I'm a partner at Extension Engine. This is my 10th year. Uh, what a partner means for us is that I work with clients on uh, sharing what we can do with them and then working with them uh, through uh, delivery. Um, I'm joined by uh, two of my colleagues, uh, John Williams and Brittany Whittemore. Um, if you do a quick intro and then we'll jump in. Uh, I'm John Williams. I'm a venture partner at Extension Engine. Um, and uh, what that means is I work closely with our clients on strategy and how to adapt um, custom and bespoke learning systems to their, uh, to their learners' particular needs. In particular, one of the uh, early focuses uh, in that work is making sure that we design our learning systems to be fully inclusive of all the learners in your community. So that's, that's, my, that's my shtick. Brittany? Right. I'm Brittany Whittemore. I'm the uh, Director of Marketing and Extension Engine. So what that means is I try and get in front of folks who are hopefully watching this video um, and who need our services. Awesome. So today we're going to go through um, uh, an overarching framework that we use to define what makes amazing online learning experiences. And we call that high engagement at scale. We're going to go through a brief introduction. We're going to introduce this big idea of what is high engagement at scale. We're going to give you an example of a learning experience that we really admire. It's Harvard Business School Online. And then we're going to close with a summary. John, I know you. Hopefully, you're going to jump in with some uh, active back and forth questions and really uh, get at things that your audience would like to hear more on. So excited and looking forward to this. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that opening. Audience, uh, the audience knows I don't need it, but I appreciate it anyway. <laughs> I'll take it anyway. Great. Before we jump in, just a quick couple of words about Extension Engine. So we're a, a professional service firm focused exclusively on building uh, custom learning experiences across three different sectors. Uh, we started out in higher ed. We worked with some amazing organizations like Harvard, MIT, uh, Notre Dame, uh, UPenn, and others. Uh, we also work with nonprofits outside of higher ed. So uh, think of uh, folks like New Teacher Center working with professional development of K-12 teachers, um, uh, youth entrepreneurs, Year Up, uh, FEs. So lots of organizations making amazing change. And the third category are uh, uh, learning businesses. So clients where they're dealing with um, something that's near and dear to you, the extended enterprise. And so when they look for learning experiences that go out beyond the kind of four walls of the proverbial uh, corporation, those types of learning experiences, uh, we've got some amazing experience with uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Microsoft, uh, and others. I should mention that we've done about 200 different learning experiences, and out of that come um, a couple of important uh, myths that we're going to bust today. So the myth number one is that uh, scale and engagement when it comes to online learning are two poles that pull against each other. You can't have both. Uh, so from the time of you know Socrates and, and uh, Aristotle and Plato, this idea that engagement was one-on-one, -on -one, it's a person, a mentor and a teacher, was different than scale, where you had a, a sage on a stage talking to um, many students. And those were just, that was just the way it is. And initially, uh, online experiences had the same uh, myth brought into life. The second myth, uh, is that great learning experience is only found online in, in academia. And these are just a handful of examples. These are a few that, that we admire. Anyone who's been 
you know, at an Airbnb, it's a remarkable experience and maybe you didn't know, but Airbnb has a wonderful training experience for hosts uh, or Salesforce has a, a, a wonderful uh, learning experience called Trailhead, which by the way, has uh, is more more beloved than the underlying, you know, the software that, that it helps you learn more about. Uh, Disney Institute is an amazing thing. Many people don't know that Disney actually teaches other um, uh, organizations on how to have great customer service. These are just three examples of amazing online learning experiences outside of academia. And uh, we think that, you know, great online learning can be found in academia and elsewhere. So I'm going to uh, dive down more deeply into this idea, but um, essentially um, Extension Engine, we, one of our core beliefs is this idea of high engagement at scale, is that you can have both of these, uh, that, that, um, that this is something that is the fundamental transformative uh, value proposition of the internet brought to learning. Mm -hmm. I want to give a quick example that um, folks might relate to. And you think of a personal trainer. Um, now this is, you know, outside of, of uh, traditional learning, but still learning nonetheless. So think of uh, going to your gym or maybe, you know, you have a trainer come to your house and there's this one-on-one -on -one experience. That is high engagement, but obviously very low scale, maybe one, two, three uh, folks touched at a time. The other end of the spectrum are YouTube fitness videos. Now these reach tens, maybe hundreds of millions of, of viewers, very low engagement, very low personalization. And something that's become hugely popular is uh, Peloton, which is both high engagement and also high scale. So millions of learners, super engaging in terms of the experience with recorded and live videos, uh, competitive gamification, uh, a community around it. And so that's a really fascinating example of both high engagement at scale. Coming back to a learning environment, um, I love this example of the Stanford D School, uh, the you know creators of design thinking. And so at the D School, super high engagement, 10,000 learners over the last decade have gone through the, the program at Stanford. So it's relative, you know, it's very high engagement, but relatively low scale. And you compare that to the 100 plus design thinking courses on Coursera, and those have reached millions of learners, but very low engagement. And IDOU is a fantastic example of high engagement at scale. So 350,000 plus learners and a remarkable uh, group uh, project-based learning experience that is um, uh, hugely ranked and, and, and very uh, high engagement. Good examples, by the way, are really, really clear to take it from real life or to from, uh, from Peloton to learning. But. Yeah, well, in, so um, what's interesting, John, is, is everyone says, well, of course I want that, right? Like, <laughs> well, it doesn't, it tastes great, less filling, right? Like it's, it, 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 of course I want that. So it comes to the fundamental question is, yeah, that sounds great, but how do I do it? The thing, at Extension Engine, we've built more than 200 uh, uh, online learning programs over the last decade. And while each one of them is different, we have been able to identify core uh, themes and, and um, uh, common uh, different ma difference making uh, parameters that, that, that create great. And that's really what we want to dive into. The, right. the, the, so this is really gets to the, how do you actually do high engagement at scale? Um, at Extension Engine, we've identified what we call the five ingredients for delivering high engagement at scale. And, you know, using kind of the food metaphor, these five ingredients uh, can be combined together. So there's not a single recipe for, for success, uh, right? Because, you know, you could have your favorite food has a lot of spice in it. And for me, my favorite food might be bland for you, but they're still our favorite foods. So when we bring it back to learning, these five ingredients are, uh, can be combined together given the context of the learning experience, who's the target learner, 
what's the institution that's providing the learning and so what we try to do with the five ingredients is to give uh, multiple recipes that will get to uh, success so let's just walk through those five ingredients and then i'll dive down more deeply into each of them uh, so i'll quick run through these so the first on the top here is uh, we call learner-centered content uh, the second one is uh, active learning the third is what uh, my partner john williams talked about is this idea of unbounded inclusivity uh, the fourth one is community connections and lastly real world outcomes particularly focused on the learner and the the outcomes that they're they're looking for and so i'd like to drill down more deeply into each of these what we did so this is the first ingredient learner center content so you can think of this as content that's you know really focused on the needs and, and desires and objectives of the learner themselves what we did was we created um, a rubric uh, that has a scale from um, you know good to great uh, and we in our scale it's from one to five so one is good five is great uh, notably we didn't go from bad to good because nobody sets out to create a bad learning experience um, and what we did was we broke down learner centered content into sub uh, categories we call them facets and in the case of learner center content, we have five facets, and each of, of these can be scored against a rubric to come up with an aggregate uh, uh, quantitative metric of how learner centered is the content for this learning experience. Now, here are the five facets so, you know, the well designed content, so high production value, um, you know, uh, good content design. The, the second category is around a varied content, so multimodal, so it's not just all video or all text, but you know, varying the use of content. Trusted sources of uh, the content, so subject matter experts uh, individually and institutionally that I trust as experts. The fourth one is, is a, a, a designing content so that it is focused on the learner's specific objectives. And the fifth one, the last idea, is the notion of some personalization or response to the learner's prior knowledge. Now, to you know, hang a little bit on some examples of this, we talked about the well-designed content. So mixing uh, video, text, uh, visuals, and um, interactive elements so that the experience is uh, exercising different parts of the uh, uh, learner's brain. Uh, this notion of uh, personalized or adaptive learning paths such that the learner uh, is, is, uh, feels like the experience is adapting to them and their needs. And uh, an example is the trusted brands. So uh, compelling instructors uh, from a brand that, that you know. And if we aggregate this up, uh, again, on this you know, one to five scale of good to great, where you think of you know uh, a one as being you know a single path for learning recorded lectures of, you know videos of a, a, a single type delivered by experts but not branded experts and a five might be a personalized learning well-designed content from a trusted brand a, an expert instructor perhaps someone i know you can see how you know different you know uh, uh, institutions and here's an, a, an example of some folks that you know names of folks that might be familiar with so you might have a udemy course so it's a you know unknown instructor uh and sometimes the production quality is fairly low there's a handful of of content types and something like a master class where while it's it's primarily focused on video and text they they went you know they have rock stars literally in terms of their you know trusted brands and it's part of their business model so that could be you know a three and a half uh, or maybe even a four in terms of learner-centered content. So let me just pause there for a second. And I'm curious, John, if this idea of, you know, a rubric for, for you know, quantifying where um, a learning experience might be on a particular dimension, this ingredient, how does that sit with what you um, had looked at and how you think about these learning experiences? Well, as an instructional designer uh, by, by education, you know, it's it's always been hard to draw a box around uh, to, to quantify the quality of content, uh, you know, throughout my whole career because it's so subjective. So what I like about it is that you've 
brought some objective to the subjective. And at least with the rubric, you can go through a couple of categories and and be less subjective. Uh, how do you use it? Uh, what, what's uh, what's the end result of this? Uh, what, is this to, to for sales or is this to judge what people already have or kind of both or? Wow, it's like you read my presentation. So <laughs> uh, I think we'll get back to that. But the issue, so it's really about uh, benchmarking, understanding where you're at today, looking at the, you know, if you have a learning experience, it's about understanding where the market is and it's understanding where you want to go and using this as a tool to, to define your roadmap or frankly, to define your, your selection process. So understanding what kind of learning experience you want and then you know, buying or building the tools to deliver on that. So I, I'll, I'll come back to that point because that is probably one of the most important points to make out of this um, uh, presentation. I so, get lucky. <laughs> well, lucky or good, you know, I can't tell. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump through uh, th these ones uh, a little bit quicker, but it's the same idea repeated. Um, in this case, it's active learning. So here, active learning is where the learning experience is designed such that it demands the participation of the learner uh, in a variety of very active and applied experiences. Here we have these facets, again, on the good to great scale, one to five, where we focus on, you know, how, how, uh, what is the extent of active versus passive learning? So this is something we look at, you know, very deeply. You can't, you know, you don't have 100% project-based learning, for example, but you also don't want to have 100%, you know, lecture. And uh, you want to make sure that you have um, uh, as, you know, as much active learning as you can uh, uh, get in is better, generally speaking. Um, integrating uh, project-based learning is a, is a core aspect of this. And then ideally some sort of authentic assessment is what we'd like to see you know the machine graded multiple choice questions is is can be sufficient or a good way to do assessment but the more authentic the assessment where the learner is able to demonstrate mastery uh you you know with some sort of you know project based or that uh assignment that can be graded against the rubric those are the those are make for wonderful active learning experiences um the thing i love is this this Third frame here where we talked about tactile uh, interactions. I love the idea of simulations or, or we call them intuition builders. So you can learn a little bit of theory and then you can play with something. It's like twiddling with the Rubik's Cube in an online experience that gives you a sense of how things work um, uh, to be able to make mistakes and iteratively learn. That's what we really look for in these active learning ingredients. Uh, here we see uh, a couple of learning experiences that you may be familiar with. Coursera, you know, it's got a limited number of, of, of you know, teaching elements. Uh, it tends to be relatively low on the scale of, of learning experiences. Uh, Udemy can have some better ones in terms of the, the interactive experience. And then one people are not terribly familiar with is Alt MBA. Uh, it's almost 100% project-based learning, very simple tools, but wow, is it a great learning experience. Students love it super active cohort based uh, you know amazing learning experience uh, and so again this is an ingredient we think it's super important if I had to pick uh, my you know favorite child I would say active learning is certainly one of them yeah well I tell you what in in uh, my circles that has become such an important topic as organizations are pivoting from just having the knowledge versus demonstrating the ability to actually do it. And uh, your examples, uh, certainly valid. The examples I ran into here recently is, are all about equipment. It's like operating heavy equipment, fixing engines. I mean, all the things that, you know, you really want to see somebody prove that they can do it and, and document it. So that active learning is more so than I've seen it in my career. It's really coming to the front, probably as technology allows that some of that to be enabled. Absolutely. Um, so the third ingredient, um, and, and I'll, I'll quick run through this. I want to invite uh, my colleague John to kind of weigh in on this. You know, inclusivity is is a remarkably important, and I think it's one of the next uh, frontiers of opportunity in online learning. Um, we believe that that inclusive design is. Um, is is a huge opportunity you know it's hard enough to learn um you know it's it's 
we don't want to make it harder by having the learners pretend to be somebody else so that they can actually learn the material. And so when we think of inclusive uh, learning, we think of universal design, we think of uh, equitable access through technology, whether it be, you know, broadband or, you know, mobile versus desktop. Uh, we think of um, equitable access through business models. So being able to support, um, uh, you know, learners with without uh, financial resources through, uh, you know, financial aid and other um, aspects of it. This idea of supporting not just the plurality uh, learner, which often tends to be um, folks that are in a majority. So, you know, here in the US, we might think about the white male learner. So we want to support that learning audience, but we also want to support in the same way um, the long tail of learners. So not just, you know, gender and race, but, you know, um, immigrant status, economic status, uh, age. So inclusivity in all its forms is important for a successful learning experience and then designing the experience so that it, it, it's a welcoming inviting uh, diversity and, and encouraging uh, communication yeah inclusion is is uh, an element that uh, we don't have a, a we meaning the learning community doesn't have a, a lot of experience in because learning has traditionally been um, instructor centered quite quite honestly the instruction has been designed by the instructor with his or her context in, in primarily in mind or certainly focused on the the, the plurality of, of learners. And so in a face to face uh, environment, uh, a campus or, or a classroom, it's it's hard to reach out in different ways to different uh, components of, of that learning of that learning community. Digital uh, technology enables just that the ability to reach out to a variety of different folks based on their profiles, based on who they are, and, and approach them where they are and um, in, a, in a context of who they are, right? So they don't have to, as, as Furkan uh, said, pretend to be someone they're not, to put on the cloak of the dominant race or gender or whatever the dimensions are, to be able to fit into the construct that the learning has been designed into. So what we want to do is design, uh, what we found is that one of the key ingredients of high engagement at scale is discerning the, designing the learning experience so that it is equally accessible by the full range of learners that you're exposing it to. That doesn't mean that every learning experience has to be accessible to everyone in the world, it means looking at the domain of learners that are the target for this experience and making sure that no student, no learner is left behind. Hmm. Lowest common denominator, taken to the next level. Yeah, it's it's exciting. I, you know, the thing that, um, you know, uh, we talk about accessibility, you know, ADA compliance is, is, is like table stakes now. Universal design and equitable access, I think, is, is where we need to be and where we want to be. Um, I think one of the things that uh, is often the focus is having subject matter experts that are diverse and inclusive so that, you know, when the, the learner is is engaging, they can see themselves in, in the learning experience. I think equally as important is context. So if, you know, you're teaching a business class or entrepreneurship, people should able be able to see you know, venture backed, you know, large organizations, you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, things that are, um, you know, uh, top shelf experiences. They should also be able to see, you know, the local, you know, three site yoga studio, right? Like something, you know, accessibility is is both subject matter experts, but also um, uh, case cases and, and uh, context that is relatable. I keep on putting the cart before the horse here because uh, I didn't uh, review your presentation. So does that mean that you're dynamically, you, you can switch case studies? Is, is that, would that be an example of how something like that would, would happen? You, so based on profile, that is part of the ad, ad, adaptiveness? Absolutely. Like, you know, why not well, make, you know, when people talk about learning paths and personalization, you know, there's nothing that says, you know, in the online world, like, Think about what Amazon does or Netflix, right? It's personalized for you. People like, you know, you 
you know, like these other things. Well, we can do that too in a learning experience. We can, you know, if, if, if we know things about you, we can provide, you know, a relatable learning experience. And if that means um, subject matter experts in context, choosing case studies that are relevant and reflective for you, yeah, let's do that. A given concept can be illustrated Great. through any number of illustrations and examples. And so in the traditional bricks and mortar world, the instructor chooses one or two or three examples that come out of that single milieu. What we can do is choose from a, a wider range, a long tail of examples, and present the examples that best fit a particular learner or a particular group of learners based on what we know about their learning, um, their cognitive styles and their learning profiles and, uh, and things that we can even learn more about as they go through um, um, uh, assessments and, and other um, interactions with the learning system. Impressive. So I'm going to jump through a few more of these because I, I want to get to a demo or an example that shows this and some follow on thoughts. Um, one of the things about inclusivity, it's today at least it's less about platform and more about, you know, course design. And so, you know, I give the example here of Coursera and it could be anywhere on this scale. So you really have to look at the underlying instructional design and uh, in, in, in course creation. Community is a super important uh, ingredient in great online learning um, and being able to deliver high engagement at scale requires community uh, because we're leveraging people beyond the instructor to both motivate and to scale learning. So think of a, a team-based project where you're giving feedback and your peers are grading your project against a rubric. That is both uh, educational for the person receiving the feedback as well as the the learner that is giving the feedback and it's done in a way that's economically scalable uh, again we have our good to great scale one to five here we look at five sub facets of the community connection so team-based projects the idea of cohorts moving through a learning experience together falls in here uh, support and peer feedback uh, design uh, so that the community is integrated uh, into the, the, the learning experience, um, having the community extend beyond the course. And we have some great examples of, for example, entrepreneurship classes and coding uh, programs where the students go on to start businesses together. And so being able to support uh, a community beyond the course material. And this last one, a little bit non-intuitive, but super important is being able to catalyze the conversation. So simply having a discussion forum is, is necessary, but not sufficient for having an active community. I apologize. There's a, a fire engine going by. I got, I got my finger on the mute because uh, it's uh, tis the season of delivery truck. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> keep on going on mute. So I, I commiserate. The... Uh, Community connections, you know, it's really about uh, the team-based projects, cohorts going through the program, and uh, creating a, a, a forum for dialogue where the conditions are right. Uh, there's psychological safety and there's diversity so that multiple viewpoints can be brought to the learning experience. Multiple viewpoints is shown by research to get better outcomes and better learning. So community is a big driver of great learning. Um, one of, you know, Coursera tends to have relatively light on the community uh, resources. One of my favorites is uh, General Assembly, both in person and online. They've really focused on cohorts working and doing group project learning. So it's both active learning and community designed together. And it's a great example of, of learners going on to uh, start companies and, and build real world relationships uh, out of the online experience. Lastly, the idea of real world outcomes. So this is the, the notion that the learners um, are solving their personal pro problems, whether it's professional, financial, uh, or, or individual goals with the learning experience and that the learning experience is designed to do that. So the good to great scale. So are we focused on the you know, learner's problems, you know, are we actually getting an outcome where the learner's financial situation improves? Um, you know, 
and uh, <clears throat> are you know oftentimes there are multiple stakeholders in what we call the learning chain. So you might have the learner, you might have a manager, you might have the institution that they work for, uh, and the provider. And if there are multiple stakeholders, each the the interests of all those need to be aligned, and there needs to be kind of proof in that. Um, you know, certificates. You know, having the right you know aligned uh, uh, payments, uh, and you know, connecting sort of the accomplishment with the recognition are all super important. A couple examples: LinkedIn Learning. You know, because of the the profile base is a great example. So we zoom through those in the last, but again, just to summarize. So there's five core ingredients, and we have this scale of one to five where we can go from good to great. And I wanted to give you an example of a learning experience that we admire. Um, this is Harvard Business School Online. Now, uh, many of us are familiar with Harvard Business School. It's a 100-year-old institution. They uh, got into the online learning business in about seven or eight years ago. This was about the time of where MOOCs became uh, popular. And they entered into this thinking, how might we differentiate ourselves from, you know, uh, all that's going on in MOOCs? Um, if we go back to that, you know, engagement versus scale, uh, at the time there was Harvard Business School. So think, you know, 800 students a year in a high engagement, low scale MBA program. And think Harvard X, where you have, you know, a million or 10 million learners, but lo relatively low engagement. So Harvard Business School Online was uh, designed to be this, you know, happy medium where it's both high engagement and high scale. So over the last, uh, since launch, it's uh, over 140,000 learners. A quarter of those have achieved real world outcomes, a promotion within a year of completing the program. And uh, almost 90% of the students that enroll complete the program. So this is a, you know, blue chip standard for online learning. It's a wildly successful program. Um, Harvard has been a client of ours, uh, uh, you know, for a long time. And, and this is a remarkable uh, program. We, like I said, we've done 200 programs. This is probably one of, if not the best learning experience. And I think there's a lot to be learned from this. Uh, when we go back to the five ingredients, this is actually a, a really unique way that we use to visualize how to think about the five ingredients and that uh, one to five, you know, good to great score. So here the, the red, uh, you know, uh, polygon is the HBSO experience um, scored against these, you know, five metrics. And you can see that, you know, community connection, learner-centered content is really where, you know, the HBSO experience is, is you know, amazing. And, I, and we put, you know, a Coursera learning experience on there to give you a sense of it. So the idea, you can think of the, the, the area of that, you know, um, polygon as being, you know, differentiated. And so it's really interesting as a framework. And John, you had touched on this earlier when you asked, well, how might you use this? So here you're getting a peek at how you can think about using the high engagement scale framework and the five ingredients to sort of say, where am I at or what's my competition at and how am I going to differentiate my learning experience from them? That makes sense? Oh yeah, outstanding. So I want to go through each of these and um, HBSO in terms of learner center content is uh, outstanding. So th it's, it's, um, it's got, you know, I don't know, I think your average learning experience has got, you know, 10, 15, content types, you know, so think of a video player, think of a multiple choice question, a text or an image. These are different, uh, you know, elements that, you know, a course author can use to create, you know, a learning experience. HBSO has got a hundred. So there's a ton of different content types and a lot of them are super interactive. If you're ever, you know, so this is for your learners who want to see what amazing is go to H HBS online and look for negotiations mastery. That is the best online course that I think has ever been built. It's the theory of negotiations, but then pretty quickly you're dropped into a negotiations course and you're negotiating with a computer, you're negotiating with your peers, 
super interactive. It's overlaid with experts who are, uh, you know, FBI's former chief hostage negotiator and business school professors. It is a five-star learning experience, really learner-centered content, highly interactive, and that's representative of what the platform and that experience can do. You ought to get a spider graph of that. Absolutely, absolutely, that's a great idea. So, that, you know, if, if you, uh, you've heard of Harvard Business School, you know that they teach with the case study. So one of the challenges that I think HBSO did an amazing job is figuring out what the case study is online. A key part of the case study is the cold call. And so that's when they're like, Mr. Lay, could you please tell me what Julie should do and you know, buy the company or, or build it? Well, here, HBSO took the approach of having a cold call. It gets prompted to a learner, and then the learner gets a countdown clock. So that simulates the anxiety, excitement, and pressure of answering a question and being asked by a professor. It also, by the way, has a really crafty seeding and catalyst of the conversation because it's getting an answer to a question and then using that to seed a conversation and invite comments by other learners. So it's, it's a very crafty way to tie active learning ingredient to the community ingredient. Wow. The inclusivity, so it is both uh, subject matter expert and context that did a great job with inviting the learners in by showing them uh, uh, protagonists of cases that uh, are relatable for the long tail of learners. And, you know, community is the best I've seen. Um, the thing with HBSO is when you join, you have to create a profile. Um, I'm reminded of, of what, it, you know, folks say about like online dating, where you have to fill out a profile, answer a bunch of questions, and then when you join, you have uh, common connections between other learners. And so as you go through as a cohort, you are connected to your learners. You can see the learners around the world, whether they're online. You can connect to them. You can ask them questions. You can connect to staff members of the HBSO program. Uh, every course has tens of thousands of comments and interactions. It is, as we saw in the completion rates, you know, 90% completion rate. Uh, this is in large part driven by the community. By the way, HBSO has a, a well, pre-pandemic has an annual conference where uh, students pay uh, to attend a conference in person. And, you know, it's a little bit like uh, going to Lollapalooza. It's an amazing experience um, and um, five-star community. Real world outcomes, you know, it's, it's a wonderful life-changing experience. HBSO sent, uh, physical certificates of completion to all of the learners and they are framed like diplomas. People put it on their LinkedIn profile. Um, it's, it, we saw from the data, it's, you know, a quarter of students are promoted. So what, so that's an example of what, you know, is a great learning experience. It ranks highly on the five ingredients. And um, I want to come back to the question, John, that you had asked at the beginning, which is how do you use this framework to, as a proactive tool? And I actually think this is something that you might use with a lot of your clients because when they come and they want to select a learning experience, uh, a piece of technology to deliver learning experience, the first step is to say, well, what learning experience do you want? And then what tools are the right tools to deliver that? So oftentimes our clients come with an existing learning experience, whether it's online or in person. And we can score that on the five ingredient uh, and create this spider chart where we, we look at what that current learning experience is. You can imagine doing market research and looking at what the market needs in terms of uh, what's going to be well responded. Not all learners are the same. If you're talking to, for example, uh, we've done work uh, with, with uh, surgeons, so highly trained individuals. And these are folks that really don't want to have uh, a lot of community interaction. You know, they want to learn in a very specific way. They want it very personalized to them. Uh, and they're trained to do a lot of personal autodidact kind of, you know, instruction. That's very different from, you know, entrepreneurs that are, you know, trying to socialize in, in, and learn in a different way. So look at, you can benchmark the market need and you can start to see, well, what do I have? You know, what's the spider chart of what I have? What's the spider chart? Of what the market need is and you can start to see some gaps and those gaps are opportunities for um you know improvements 
Now there's a third overlay, which is what is my corporate goal? And you can, you know, the corporate goal doesn't necessarily have to be mapped one to one to what the, you know, market need is. Sometimes it is. It might take into it, for example, um, competitive landscape. Like what are my comp? What are what are what is the competition doing, and how am I differentiating from them? So, for example, if I'm competing, you know, to pick somebody masterclass, right? I'm not going to compete with masterclass on having famous, you know, uh, instructors. I might, for example, decide, oh, I'm going to compete with them on community, you know, and so you kind of find a way to leverage a different ingredient to create a competitive advantage. And you can use that throughout your marketing, your recruitment, your onboarding, your learning experience, and your alumni status. So this is actually really the roadmap that we work with clients with. We look at where are they at, where do they want to be, and a roadmap to get them there. We look at what's the cost per unit improvement in each, each ingredient. So for example, I know a one-point improvement on community and the feature roadmap, given the tools that I have available and the content production might cost me $200,000 per point, whereas on uh, content, it's only $150,000 per point. So I might make some decisions based on you know, budget allocation or time allocation. So it's a really powerful framework for making management decisions on how to go from good to great. Um, the other piece of it, so we've been talking a lot about what makes great online learning. So that's the five ingredients and in, in the high engagement at scale framework shown here on the left. On the right is what we think about as the, the methodology. So how do we as extension engine actually deliver on that and partnering with our clients? So there's two pieces to that. The first one is in the middle. It's what we call our digital uh, learning lenses. And this is a, a three lens approach where we look at uh, three different components of the learning experience. So one is the program design. Uh, the second is the learning design, and the third is the platform, or, um, and, and it includes the LMS, but also can include things beyond the LMS, so you know, e-commerce, tutoring, community, and other kind of tech tools that constitute the platform. The three of those lenses together is what you create the experience with, and tweaks to one you know, can, can drive the other, et cetera. So that's an important step, and we use that tool to figure out what is the right you know, combination of ingredients for a client. And then the the thing on the right there is the phases that we use for delivery. So we have a designing plan and a design and planning phase. Uh, we followed by a, a build phase where we're assembling the learning experience. And then the three third phase is where we operate train and transfer. So our goal when we work with a client is to design an amazing experience, partner with them to build it. And the third is to transfer that experience to them so that they can run it without us. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the, three, the, the three lenses, but this is really, uh, I think, the core of how we, um, you know, I mentioned earlier in, in, in the, the five ingredients, like each, you know, there's no one single recipe. This is the tool we use to figure out the right recipe for our clients. Um, we have, one of the things is, is um, we, we, you know, our clients uh, oftentimes are using LMSs that, that, you know, you cover, right? So, so you know, they'll, they'll create a custom learning experience using an off-the-shelf LMS, um, whether it's, you know, SkillJar or NovoEd or, you know, one of these, you know, I don't know, one of the 800 of them now. So there's a ton of these learning experiences. <laughs> um, and, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, one can be better than the other. And so this is a great framework to figure that out. Sometimes a client will come and they'll have an existing LMS. And so it's, it's not an opportunity, it's a constraint. So it's like, what can we do with this learning experience? Um, in the, some cases, our clients come and they have a, a, you know, just a unique set of requirements and they want to build a custom learning experience. So we have built and open sourced a, a tool we call Taylor, which is a framework for creating a uh, custom LMS. So it's all the back end plumbing and infrastructure for creating an active learning community based 
high engagement at scale learning experience. And uh, it's, you know, uh, open source, so it's open for anyone to use. And, um, and so we monitor, you know, our, our business model is professional services. So sometimes we're implementing this, sometimes we're implementing on top of an existing LMS. And I want to close, because I know we're coming up on time here, uh, with questions that are on our mind. So one of the things that we've seen over the last, you know, decade, and John, I'm sure you've seen this too, is what is innovative today becomes standard for tomorrow. And so that frontier of innovation in creating high engagement scale, like what makes a five, you know, learning experience on, on the ingredients is forever improving. And so these are some of the questions that I think are on the frontier of innovation in terms of expanding what is, uh, you know, uh, best in class in terms of online learning experiences. So we're thinking about, you know, um, how do we uh, uh, make learning fun? You know, we're thinking about how can the platform uh, design, be designed for specific learner types? Like, for example, John and I worked uh, with um, uh, a nonprofit organization serving HBCUs, the historically black college and universities, an enormously influential product where they're pondering the question, how might they design an LMS for the black learner? Like, you know, everyone talks about content, everyone talks about program design. Can the LMS be tailored towards a specific learner? Um, uh, what can be done at scale? Like, uh, there's a lot of really high scale learning experiences out there that have very low engagement. So that's an interesting question is how can we bring engagement uh, to large scale learning experiences? Um, yeah, so there's a ton of questions here. And this is frankly where we thrive on the hard problems. We love coming, you know, when clients come to us and say, we don't know if this is possible. Can, can, can you help us? And we're like, heck yeah, let's figure that out. That's it. What do you think, John? I love it. I love it. The instructional designer in me is just doing backflips. Uh, this, you know, audience, uh, for those of you who have been following along in the series, you know, this sounds different than anything that we've, we've covered before here in the last year, because it is, um, instead of focusing on the platform and really a lot of good things coming from how, you know, the, the standard way of doing things, this is a way of, of really taking it to a whole new level of what you're trying to achieve. And it's, it's almost like the olden days where now content is the learning experience is back out in front of the platform again and for a lot of years and i think for a lot of organizations it's, it's still the reverse so i love the forward thinking i've never you know i've as i mentioned in in you know in in the middle uh, part here that you know the rubric uh, idea the whole framework is is just genius uh, you know i've in a lot of different uh parts of my career, I've seen different organizations trying to frame out, you know, what an hour of learning costs or, you know, different ways of, you know, framing this. And I've never seen anything so strategic in, in, uh, in doing that. And then as that translates to how you can help your clients benchmark, how you can help them since it's, it's training for a business in almost every case, you know, how you can help them benchmark across the industry and then develop areas of competitive differentiation you know, for a quantifiable sum, you know, all that stuff is uh, things that are unheard of. That's why Luna the dog is back in here. She's now reinterested after all that you know, this, the discussion. Uh, but the, you know, all of that is, you know, a step beyond what you would typically see. But the interesting part is all the things that you were talking about, uh, learning by doing the tactile parts, you know, working with the adaptive, the inclusivity, these are all things that uh, our clients, you know, we're, we're hearing them bring up more and more uh, inside the process. So it's um, maybe your, your most salient point is, you know, what's uh, the bar today is, is you know, going to be higher. I, I think your type of solution is going to, you know, keep on becoming more and more of the standard because that's where people want to go to. And the minute that they benchmark and, and see that somebody else is eating their lunch because of these great digital learning experiences, then, you know, that'll drive competition and, and innovation. I, I think in other parts of the, the industry to, to try to mimic uh, the, the, the type of things that you're doing, which won't be easy. So all in all, I absolutely love it. It's a, I'll let John, a super impressive. validating. I love, I love the feedback and, 
I, we believe this too. I mean, we've seen 200 of these things and, you know, it's from that experience that we've, you know, kind of created this framework and it is a tool, you know, cause everybody sees this, you come in and you probably more than anyone, there's, I don't know, there's hundreds of these learning management systems. And oftentimes it feels like it's just throwing spaghetti at the wall. Like I got this new feature and it's sort of to what end. And I think that's the, 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 the question that, the framework answers high engagement at scale is what makes great learning experience. And then we have mm -hmm. these five components. So then it becomes like, okay, I want my learning experience to be differentiated on active learning and community. For example, like those are my two things. So you bring me solutions that deliver on that. I want plus two over my competitor on active learning. Make mm -hmm. that so. Now right. it becomes clear. I, I know what I have to do. And you're like, how much does that cost me? How much time does it take? What's the best solution? Mm -hmm. And we can give executive leadership a dashboard to benchmark where they're at. They can look at an individual product. They can look at a portfolio. They can look at their roadmap. That's what high engagement at scale can do for a client. Wow. Wow. Well, if you're a high end uh, listener right now, this is uh, exactly what you want to hear. Uh, so many of, uh, you know, since I, I get to see so many of those 800, uh, I hear the reverse pitch uh, all the time. And the reverse pitch is how quick can we build this learning experience? You know, here, we're doing this and you grab a video, we'll grab a PDF, we'll put this together. You know, you can have that out, uh, you know, with with no concept of the big picture of, of what you're trying to do. And, and so, uh, you know, as, as you brought it home today, the big picture is, and that's what the best organizations start with and work backwards uh, versus how quick they can get something out the door. Um, and so I can see where you fit into the marketplace uh, for sure, um, where I like to be at the high end. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time to bring us all up to speed today. Audience, I told you this is why it's my favorite series because you get to see and talk about things that uh, you just won't ever do in normal life and it's not the type of thing you can read on a website you know to bring it home like this so um extension engine thanks so much for carving out the hour and educating us all uh we wish you the best of luck in the marketplace and uh i'm sure you'll find uh lots of uh high-end clients here that are going to be calling you thinking what about us i wonder what our spider graph looks like and so i encourage that to happen listeners everyone have a great day and we'll see you thanks, on the next Tom. you can find more thanks, of our event you can find more of our independent resources at talentedlearning.com. Uh, thanks, Essential. Have a great day.